The worst thing that happened to me as a beginner learning character modeling was to start with sculpting and retopology. I inevitably failed and realized this was just not for me. I better get back to drawing. I was about to give up on 3D modeling, but I decided to make some more research on YouTube, trying to find easier and faster methods for modeling characters. The algorithm did its thing, and finally I found what I was looking for. It was not easy, but after many months of work and failures, I had finally mastered the different 3D modeling techniques that would allow me to create all the characters I ever wanted. I have now been using this technique for almost 2 years, and made all these characters on the way. This workflow is in my opinion easier and faster for beginners to learn and also people that don't have a powerful PC or a drawing tablet. Most of the characters are low poly and can be used for animation and games. As I'm learning how to use Godot Game Engine, which is like a cousin of Blender, I decided to model one of my characters and make a bunch of animations with it. So I thought this is actually a good occasion to show you my workflow. So I'll walk you through my process of modeling characters, how I texture them and rig them for animation and games. Let's dive into it. It all starts with an image. I always use a reference image when creating a 3D model. It's the easiest way to match the real size and look of the character. So I made this character sheet where I drew a front profile and three quarter view of the character. Now if you don't know how to draw, learn how to draw. Or even faster. You can always try to get character sheets of your favorite characters on the internet. Just google for example Pikachu reference image and boom, all you need is here. Once you have your image, you can now add it to your scene by pressing Shift plus A, choose Add Image Reference. Now, here's how I set it up. First, I need one for the front view, then I'll duplicate it and place it here for the profile view. Perfect. Now I can switch between front and profile orthographic view by pressing 1 and 3 on my numpad. Alright, let's start with the real modeling now. Every character has its own particularities, so not all modeling processes are going to look the same. Some characters have anime faces, other cartoony style, other have tails or long ears. So depending on the style you are going for, some steps of the process will change a little bit. For this video, we are going with a simple character, so I'll start blocking the head with a cube. Whereas for Madara for example, I started with a single vertex and blocked the face. That's typically for the anime style characters. I start by making sure I have the right height for the character using a cube or this measure tool. And after I scale down the reference image to match the size and I place the front image at the center of the wall for the symmetry. So I can refer to it when using the mirror modifier later. I then add a cube and cut it in half to mirror it with the mirror modifier and then we can start blocking the head. The goal is to have a character with a relatively low poly count. So I'll try to keep the shape as simple as possible then I add a subdivision modifier. I make sure to add loop cuts only when it's necessary. Mostly around the eyes and the ears as those are the parts that are going to be deformed the most. For the face we go with a different approach, simpler than carving a real mouse. We're going to use textures. I experimented it with my Ben 10 and Robot Boy models and the result is really satisfying. Some games use these techniques cause it's easier to animate. That is why I have not touched the mouse area until now. But I carved eye sockets because I'm going to use shape keys to control them so I won't have to go through all the rigging process and I'll have more control over how the eyes will deform. Also, using real eyes will allow me to add pupils that I can move around the eye area without any problem. It would be complicated to get this result with textures. Hey, so at the end of the day, what matters the most is your ability to identify what aspects of other techniques is going to fit more the style you're going for. And the more you practice and test the different approaches, the better you'll get at it. You'll notice that I don't really follow the exact size of the reference image. That's because I know this character very well because I've drawn him so many times. And I'll tell you more about his story later. But for other characters, I keep it as close to the reference as possible. After I'm done working on the head, I extrude out the neck and then the upper body from it. I then keep extruding it down until I have the pelvis. From there I create faces for the crotch area and then I extrude the legs from it. I then try to give the body an anatomically correct shape. It doesn't need to be perfect, just believable. You'll see me use the sculpt tools at times. That's because it's faster than moving vertices around. So when editing, I like to go into sculpt mode and use the smallest tool to fix some bumps. After that, I start by cutting a hole near the shoulder area and then I extrude the arms out of it. Now, I know I'm going to need to add loop cuts on the body both horizontally and vertically, but I don't want to ruin the topology of the head in the process. So I'm going to separate it from the rest of the body by deleting one edge loop around the neck area. Now, I can add loop cuts vertically without them reaching the head. I always make sure I have enough geometry around the parts that are going to move a lot like the joints and around the spine so I can avoid getting artifacts when the body is deformed after rigging. Now, I'm going to model the hands. The same way I did with the head, 
I am also going to separate it from the body for the same reasons. It's usually advised to model the arms in A pose rather than T pose like I'm doing right now. But I think it's simpler to edit in T pose as the mesh is already aligned with the axis of the world. So when you need to extrude or scale or rotate, it's much easier than if you were in A pose. However, when I'm done modeling the arms, I put them in A pose before rigging, as it is a better rest pose for the shoulders than the T pose. When modeling hands, the most important is to make sure you have a good topology that allows the finger to deform well, and that's what I'm focusing on. I try to have a good edge flow so we don't have shading problems or bad deformations. I add extra geometry around the knuckles as they are going to move a lot after rigging. After I finished modeling the hands, I'm going to attach them back to the arms using the loop tools. So basically it's an add-in that you can enable in Blender preferences. It allows you to bridge two parts of a mesh that have the same number of vertices at their limits. Now, the problem is that the number of vertices at the limit of the hand is bigger than the arms. So I'm going to reduce it by merging some vertices together. What I keep in mind when choosing which vertices to merge is how that will affect the edge flow of the hand overall. I want to make sure that the hand joint will be well connected to the arm and the joint is going to deform well. Um, okay. Mm -hmm. um, right. Okay. Um, so he, um, he said that you guys should uh, support me and subscribe. Thanks Chopper. Before joining the two parts, I added the elbow joint using the diamond topology or double diamond, which is a way to create extra geometry around the joint and mimic how a real elbow bends. This will allow very smooth deformation after rigging. I then rotate the forearm a little just as your real forearm would be if you were standing in T-pose, then I can finally connect the hand. Also, do not forget to delete the subdivision and mirror modifiers before joining the hand, otherwise it's going to add up to the body's modifiers and you don't want that. Now I'll do the same with the legs and the feet. As I said earlier, I'm still trying to get a look that's anatomically acceptable. So I make sure the model has enough definition around the calves and the thighs. And just as we did for the elbow, I'm going to create the knee joint using the same technique. Finally, it's time to reconnect the head to the rest of the body. And same thing as we did for the hands and the feet, I'll merge some vertices to match the vertex count of the head. And I'm also making sure the edge flow is redirected properly. At this point, the model is done. I just need to add some extra bits such as the nails, the tail, the hair, the whiskers, and the eyebrows, and then we can move on to texturing. Since I want to use this model in a game engine, I thought it would be better to have a very simple shader setup. That's why I went with this basic tone shader, using a diffuse BSDF, a shader to RGB node, and a color ramp. This makes it possible to have a simple cell shading that I can play with to get the color I want. For the eyes, I use just an emission shader to make sure that they stay white all the time. And I did the same for the pupils. Later on, I customized the pupils shader so I could switch between these theory eyes materials and the base color. So I've never done any game dev before, but I have a background in programming because I'm also an engineer. And I've seen Godot and I've been watching some videos about game dev and I, I tried some tutorials about Godot. And so far I'm really excited to try this out. It looks like so much fun. I'm doing this just for fun, obviously. Yeah, I think sometimes it's good to break from the routine and try out new things. So yeah, I hope it's, go it's gonna go well. The only time I did some texture painting was with the hands and the feet. I first unwrapped the model using Smart UV Project, because I'm lazy. And then I added a texture mask that basically allows me to reveal the secondary color by painting on the white part of the palm. I then adjusted the sharpness of the texture using a color ramp. Now, the final part of the texturing process is the mouse. I am really satisfied with how it turned out. I can really see that cartoony effect I wanted without deforming the head. That would be more complicated with a real mouse. So how does this work? It's actually very simple. First I select the mouse area and I separate it from the head. Some people prefer to just duplicate it and place it above, but I would have a lot of clipping issue with this shape. Then I unwrap the mouse plane and I go into UV editing. Then here I place the UV island properly. Then I export it as an image so I can use it in my drawing software as a guide. After that, I open Clip Studio. You can do this with any drawing software, by the way. And then I import the image of the UV island, and I'll place it below my drawing layers as it is my guide. Then all I have to do is draw a bunch of textures for the mouse, and I'll just make enough to have different expressions. And then I export them one by one and make sure they have a transparent background and are named in a sequence like this. Back in Blender, I select the mouse and add a mix color node and an image sequence node. I then am prompted to select the images I want to use for the node and I select my mouse textures properly named. After that I plug my images to the mix shader. Then I go back to UV editing tab. 
to make sure the images are well oriented and after that I'll use a driver to control the image sequence node and this is the result. I already made a video where I explained the whole process in detail so feel free to check it out. For the line art, it's just a basic inverted hole system using an emission shader and a solidify modifier. I also add a mask vertex group that will allow me to reduce the thickness of the line art on some areas of the body using weight painting. And for the eyes, I simply assigned an emission material to the contours for more consistency. Caddy is a CEO, so he has to look like he's got responsibilities. For that reason, I made a nice blue switch for him. Now, you might be wondering, why this color? Why is the line art blue? And why is Caddy orange in the first place? Well, back in junior high school, I was introduced to color theory. And my art teacher told me that colors that were opposite to each other in the color wheel were complementary. So orange and blue were complementary, meaning that they go well together. Uh, but I had already noticed that in many anime shows like Dragon Ball Z and Naruto, where the main characters have like those really flashy blue and orange outfits. So when I was writing the story of my animation series, I thought it would be interesting to use this color theme where the, the main character is blue and all the world around him is made of shades of blue. But there would be only one character with a different color and that was Katie. The relationship between Malo and Kedi was supposed to be the, one of the main plots of the, the whole animation series. But after two months of hard work, I published the video and it completely flopped. And honestly, I took it well because I got to learn a lot of things during the process. Also, I learned how to use grease pencil. I then made a spin-off of uh, Malo and KD show named uh, Car Malo, where Malo is an employee of a car dealership, very particular car dealership, and his boss was none other than KD. And that's how this character was made. There is a lot more to these characters and these stories, but for now I'll keep it in my drawer and focus on making less exhausting content. The simplest way to make clothes is to select the area of the body that will be covered by the clothes, and duplicate it and separate it. From there, you'll have all the freedom to edit the clothes into whatever you want. Plus you'll have the same topology as the body, so you won't have clipping issues when it's deforming. That's how I made this suit. But I gotta admit I struggled a bit with the color, but overall I like the style. I also made him a little tight to complete the CEO look and now we can start rigging. The rigging is both the hardest and the most rewarding step because you'll sometimes get some weird issues, mostly if you're making a very special character, but it's also when the character really comes to life. Seeing the head and the limbs move properly after rigging makes me think it was all worth it. I mostly use Rigify when rigging a character because I think it's a really great add-in that makes the process of rigging very simple and easy to pick up for people who are not familiar with rigging. What's even better now with Blender 4.0 is that the UI is more user friendly and you can find most of the tools you need whether it is for your bone collections or creating the rigs user interface directly on the armature tab. What's cooler is how modular the meta rigs can be. Most of my characters have special abilities that don't exist on the base rig. So to add extra controllers to the base rig, you can use this library of rig samples to add anything you want. You can add tails, tentacles, hands, mouse, etc. So my rigging process for this model was to start with a base human rig then I added hands using a finger sample, then I added a tail, then two other tail samples for the hairs and the thigh, and also two more for the ears. Finally, I added extra bones for the eyebrows, the pupils, the eyes shape key controller, the whiskers, and the mouse texture controller. I then generated the rig, parented the body to the rig, had some issues with the weight painting of the head and the toes, fixed the issues, parented the tail, the glasses, the hairs, and all the extra parts, then I created shape keys for the eyes and used the driver to control them with the bone. I also did the same for the whiskers and then finally I parented the pupils and here's the final rig. Making a character is not as easy as we often see on some videos. Most tutorials are made by experimented artists that have been honing their skills for a very long time. All that experience built through years of practice can't be resumed in a single video. So don't feel frustrated if you can't figure it out after watching one or two tutorials. My first 3D models were total failures, but I saw it as learning opportunities. And from there I practiced more and more and was finally able to make a good character from scratch. Get inspired by the workflows presented to you, embrace this long journey of learning, and you will definitely get the rewards you are seeking. Or just wait for AI to take over. Thanks for watching and see you next time. Bye.